Engineers are looking at every aspect of how we transport our products, add efficiency to our cities, and even move ourselves. We've seen a tremendous shift with the expansion of the electric vehicle market, but with drone delivery, autonomous transport, and smart cities just over the horizon, how should we as engineers prepare to for the further expansion of these trends, and what design considerations should we be learning more about? It's always seemed to me that in times of any economic uncertainty, that generally leads to some great innovations from the engineering side that end up propelling the economy out of any potential downturn and bring an economy that's even stronger, broader, and wider with some great innovations in the market. Certainly as we end 2022 right now, we're seeing a lot of uncertainty with where the economy is going, different global things going on still, um, even after the pandemic, that add to a lot of that uncertainty. But my personal hope is that's gonna to lead to a lot of us as engineers looking at the problems of the world today and coming up with great and innovative ways on how we address them. And then on the other side of that, there are gonna be a lot of really cool and exciting products for us to be designing and working on. Certainly we've already seen that happen a lot in the space of transportation with electric vehicles taking and growing their overall market share throughout the world. But I think when we look at transportation, there's a lot of new innovative ways outside of just our own vehicles and what we drive, it's gonna change the way we look at transportation, not just on how we move ourselves, but how we move everything throughout the planet. Today, I have the privilege of speaking with Ralph Kladke, who's the CTO of Transportation Solutions at TE, and someone that I think has got an amazing vision and understanding of where this transportation and mobility market is gonna go over the course of the next decade. Ralph, thanks so much for joining us on The Current today. Thank you very much, Todd. I think it's an opportunity to be here. I really enjoy that, to talk about uh, the future, to see how the mobility is moving in the next decade. Because uh, when we look right now, what is happening with all the electric vehicles all over the world, uh, who would have thought that about 10 years ago, what is going to happen? And now we see uh, all these electric vehicles spreading everywhere, a market of 1.3 uh, billion dollars uh, ramping up by 2028. And when you see the speed, so like in China, we expect uh, just by 2030, about 50% of all new vehicles turning into electric vehicles. And when we all think this is a big disruption already getting against the combustion engines, then uh, there's much more to happen. I think this is just the beginning of a disruption. So we see now a complete ecosystem, the electrification of everything, what is happening right now. And uh, when we look a little deeper into that, uh, I think a big incubator of that are the smart cities. So what we see here, uh, all these big cities, even if you look now uh, in Europe, the bigger cities, some start blocking one lane where you can have e-bikes, uh, e-scooters uh, to have this micromobility ramping up. Mobility as a service, we see it more and more here. Yeah. But uh, when we look a little deeper, uh, just uh, on the autonomous part, so we thought all a couple of years ago we would have robotaxis everywhere, running around right. and taking over. And what we see here is surprisingly that even the autonomous trucks are passing the robotaxis. So right. we see on the, on the highways, and I think even in the US, uh, which is a little closer to you than Switzerland here, uh, we see uh, companies going forward on, on that way. So we see that... When you see now we have bottlenecks of drivers, we have zillion of packages that are being sent in and out, ideally delivered on an hourly basis to everyone. And uh, then we see bottlenecks of drivers for the trucks. So what does that right. mean? Uh, we have such a bottleneck of drivers, so why should now a truck take over? The, the big issue here is uh, cost driven. When you see that an autonomous truck can be operated at just 45% uh, of the total cost of ownership. So someone yep. running an autonomous truck can afford to invest into sensors, into computing power. So the cost for turning into autonomous are not that big. And this most likely will start in controlled areas, like on the highways, where you say right. this is uh, controlled and safe, ideally uh, in good weather, but even in bad weather, I think the capabilities when you can afford more sensors, more sensor fusion, that's feasible. So turning into that. So this is step by step uh, really going forward and that's a market of 1.5 billion in the next few years turning on wow. 
And uh, when, you, when you just look what is happening with the sensor fusion, with all these sensors, even on the car side, we see already 50 sensors. So a truck can afford much more. And when you look in the car side, we still see a lot of blocking areas. When we think about private cars turning into autonomous, so there are several barriers. So the first one is uh, cost. Yeah. When you think about sure. 50 sensors, 70 sensors all around, uh, that is a huge amount of cost. And people that operate a private car are not willing to pay $20,000 more for all the computing power right. you might need. So therefore it's more simplified. And uh, right. when, you, when you look into that, there's as well, some humans don't accept yet the autonomous cars. Yeah, in sure. our environment. There's still the polls you see, 48% have doubts. Uh, it's, it will take time. Yeah, the other issue right. is uh, looking into that, that uh, the uh, liability, the legal issues are, are, are a point. Yeah? When you go to higher levels of autonomy, so when the driver is no more in charge, then someone has to take liability. So some legal frameworks are already prepared, but not all. And that's something that uh, will take time to get to get forward. Yeah? Right. And uh, last but not least, I think un undefined scenarios. When you have mixed traffic, when you have a construction area, when you have kids playing at the street, soccer, right. football, uh, then interruptions mm -hmm. where the scenarios cannot be trained. So this is something right. blocking. Even a simple thing when you have, let's take a shuttle bus, fully autonomous, on a, on the right lane with a a solid line just stopping because there's a car parked in the second row so an autonomous right. car will not move it will just stand still because the line is solid it will not go around any driver would go around uh, the car in the sure. second row and would keep moving so these scenarios are still at the edge of what we see and that is blocking the the private cars yeah what is right. i think much more interesting on the private car side is that we have uh, the um, <clears throat> the topic of autonomous safety. So we still have 1.3 million fatalities globally, which is totally okay. unacceptable. And uh, with the autonomous safety, so with all the sensors, and that's a package that you can afford easily. So the level two plus of autonomous driving, where still the driver stays liable, that is something that is growing quickly. So here we talk about about an 11 billion market at least. Yeah. Right. So that's something that is moving quickly. Wow. Wow. And uh, I think what is even more stunning when you look a little bit forward is uh, mobility as a service. I think we start now to check, especially in larger cities, what is available. Uh, can I book a car? Can I book uh, an e-bike? Can I book an e-scooter? But that is a market when you look forward. In the biggest cities especially, people don't want to afford to buy a car. Because 94% of the time it sits somewhere parked in the city, blocking the right. inner city, 94% of the car of the time the car is not used. So, and you have the entry barrier to buy a car. With the mobility as a service, this market is exploding right now. Uh, all the right. forecasts show nearly 20% growth rate year <laughs> by year. And we're talking about more yeah. than 700 billion market in the next right. uh, time until 2030. So that is an amazing area. And here even we will see robo taxis because again, similar to the autonomous trucks, if you have a, a big city in the inner circle where you don't want to have so many cars, we will see that people will block the inner circle of the cities. That we will see robo taxis that you can order and then you can dream a little bit ahead of a few years. You can say, I have my smartphone with my artificial intelligence, my personal avatar that knows Todd, uh, you like a nice ambient lighting. It knows your seat position when you get to the autonomous car. It will continue the video you've been watching before and it will order you the right drink that you prefer. <laughs> so <laughs> this is something that we, we will see and it's not too far along, uh, especially when you don't have the mixed traffic. It's much nicer, much easier to have such kind of uh, service then. So this will pick up uh, quickly. Yeah. The right. I, I mean, it Disruption is the only word for all that you're describing, and yeah. I think it's gonna, you know, it's gonna happen faster than we realize in some ways. I mean, I think I, I look the thing I the technology I always look back on is I think back just 20 years ago, right? And mm -hmm. if in 2002 someone had handed me one of today's smartphones and said, you know, you know, take a look at this technology, 
I think I would have dropped it and said, this is black yeah. magic. This can't exist. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, it would have completely blown my mind. I really think that when we look at the next step of innovation, when we're looking at 2032 and we're looking at 2042, we're going to be looking at the advances in transportation in the exact same way and saying, what the, what's happening here is not even possible. Mm -hmm. If we were to see that, that technology today, our minds would be absolutely blown. And what you're describing, I think, makes a lot of sense with the advances that we're seeing, certainly in sensor technology, with the advances that mm -hmm. we're seeing um, in just the way we actually power our vehicles. Yeah. And then on top of that, add in the rapidly expanding capabilities of artificial intelligence and machine learning in embedded systems that don't require these supercomputers anymore. It really is an exciting area. Yeah. Especially when you look at the mega trends. So the mega trend of mobility, strongly influenced by sustainability. So that's why we have e-mobility. It's influenced by connectivity. So everything will be connected, will talk to each other. Like the V2X topic, uh, vehicle to everything. So if everything talks to everything, we talked before about autonomous safety. So that we can use right. autonomous driving capability sensors to get smarter, to have emergency braking, lane assist, uh, better safety features. When we have vehicle to everything, that means that in a city, uh, every participant in traffic can talk to everyone. Infrastructure will take information. So you have a car, uh, it will be known what is the position, what is the speed vector, uh, when will it be where. If a car would cross a red traffic light, then all other participants would know that would go into emergency right. braking. Even the car crossing the red light could be forced into an yeah. emergency braking. Yeah? If you have your kid uh, going to school and it's still dark outside, in the backpack it could have a V2X. So that everyone right. in the traffic would know there's a kid or someone on a bicycle, even in the darkness. So that's a big asset in safety. So all the V2X, and that's a market, when, when you look into that, that's really going big here. So we yeah. talk about 140 billion for that market. It's not just wow. automotive, it is infrastructure, it's all kind of participants in the traffic. So right. it's something that will change our world completely, especially the safety world will be changed dramatically. Yeah. Right. And I think for us as engineers, I mean, when we're talking about vehicle to everything, because I think a lot of what we're talking about, your mind immediately goes to how are we going to change the way we, that, yeah. that we design cars and trucks and drones and things along those lines. But when we're talking about a vehicle to everything smart city, which I think is really what you're discussing here, it's going to change the way that we as engineers look at designing everything from a stop sign to a stoplight to a, a child's backpack, like you mentioned. It really changes all those things. What are the considerations from your side that engineers are going to have to start thinking about, not just on the designing the vehicle, but when they're designing all the rest of that infrastructure? What are the considerations that engineers are really going to have to have at the forefront of their minds? We have a lot of discussion here at T Connectivity because we are in all different industries, in energy, in medical, in uh, transportation. When you look at the future, we talked about the smart city. So this is a seamless connectivity everywhere. So you start in your home, you have your smartphone. There is a smart refrigerator, smart TV, yeah. uh, the smart home where everything is connected, uh, where your artificial intelligence will tell you, hey, Todd, uh, your orange juice is short. Would you like to buy new orange juice? Yeah. Then right. like when you just watch a movie from your smart TV, you have ordered with mobility as a service, you've ordered, and let's go one step further, a mobility pot. Yeah, the mobility right. pot will come to your home. Yeah, you transfer to the mobility pot, you can continue to watch your movie. The mobility pot, that's for one person usually, sometimes two, uh, would then move either to a train, to a public transport, you could stay in your pot. And those would be lined up and would go to the next train station. You could get out. The other concepts where you have uh, such a pot, which is then getting on an autonomous car chassis. So you can be transferred to that. And even the next uh, level is, <laughs> is inside, that it goes to an air taxi. That this mobility pot would then be picked up by an air taxi and you s start from driving to fly to your next destination. So. Right, right. And yeah, this, and now we're starting to get into the world of Wally here a little bit yeah. from Pixar, I think. So. Yeah. <laughs>
we're all kind of living in a pod. I think it, that's going to mean uh, a lot more exercise equipment that we're going to have to be designing as well, I think. Oh, for sure. <laughs> <laughs> Which is already probably a good thing. Yeah. Now, in order for all, I mean, because this, from a technological standpoint, I think you and I as engineers can see just from a technology design standpoint, I, I can make the line from A to Z uh, in that kind of a vision and how that works. And I can say, yeah, from, I, I absolutely think that that technology can exist and we can make that happen. I think one of the things that's going to slow us down a lot is, and in some ways rightfully so, is government regulation on that, again, for the safety of the community and making sure that you know, users are going to be perfectly safe in that. So there's going to have to be government regulation. Um, how exactly is the industry addressing that and looking at that and working with all the governments around the world to make yeah. sure that we're expediting some of that process today to keep up with the technology? Because it would be a shame, I think, for, for you know, a lot of that to bog down the technology because we're, we're, we're so do, looking at it such an after fact, having to wait for legislation to pass, having to wait for legislation to you know, be fully reviewed um, in order for us to actually experience this vision you've kind of outlined. Yeah. I think a big driver is uh, we have the mission to zero emissions, but we have mm -hmm. as well the mission to zero fatalities. So the right. zero fatalities are, re are really a big driver. And we see that governments are interested in moving out. So they yeah. try to experiment. How can we have, for example, we know mixed traffic is difficult. So then some dedicated areas are open for autonomous driving. Like in Germany about a year ago, I think that was the first country that opened up for level four autonomous driving. But again, in controlled areas at a certain speed uh, with a, certain, a lot of safety measures, because uh, the companies here have a responsibility. And here we see uh, a lot of difference. Some companies say, okay, uh, if I drive, let's say 100,000 miles, how many accidents am I going to have? When my autonomous car proves that I have a lower amount of accidents, then they say, okay, I'm good. I'm better than a human driver. Yeah. So let's move ahead. But right. I can right. tell the premium companies would not accept if a kid is hit, has a fatality, yeah. you're on front page number one on the news. Oh, absolutely. They don't want that. So yeah. therefore they go much more cautious. We all have a responsibility to keep the fatalities to the minimum. And that's why it's right. better to be slower on that point and move sure. in controlled areas and have a controlled risk in order to exactly avoid that. So I think this is, this is important, extremely important. And the legal barriers, I think, are healthy. And we need to mm -hmm. see if we can find, uh, like when I said the, the law in Germany, when you have some controlled areas, when you can go ahead, when you can experiment and uh, very often right. you start with a safety driver. Yeah, uh, there's right. like in the cities, we have these autonomous buses that go sure. 40, 50 kilometers an hour and slowly increasing the speed on the highway right now, it's limited to 60 like Mercedes did that. So to get to higher speed, it needs time to really be sure that we regarding safety are on the safe side. Yeah, right. So this is something that, um, needs a lot of cooperation and a lot of training and uh, the takeaway is that it's better to take the time needed and just when you look what what is feasible right now when you see a car we have how how's a car operating you have two visual sensors your eyes there's brain power yeah, more or less iq i don't know and uh, then with that and the wiper and some lights uh, you operate 24 seven all weather conditions with a car. When right. you transfer that into an autonomous driving, then you have visual sensors, you have the camera, you have an artificial intelligence that needs to be trained. And uh, you have in addition, you have LIDAR, you have radar, yep. uh, we get yep. sensor fusions. You, in theory, these sensors are much more capable than the two human eyes. So, right. uh, but still, technology is struggling to get the sensor fusion right, uh, to get right. all the scenarios trained. So it's not to be underestimated how powerful the human brain is. And with two eyes and a wiper and some light, we can operate in bad weather conditions. When you drive right now a car, you get the warning, uh, the sensors are not uh, safe anymore. <laughs> so please right. stay over. Right. So mm. right. therefore, I would say let's, like with the trucks, let's go from controlled environment, uh, step by step in the right direction. 
and keep in focus that the number of fatalities has to really go down to zero. The mission Absolutely. to zero fatalities is the, is the main goal. Absolutely. Yeah, I think there's the other aspect, you know, we're talking about just, you know, the vehicle itself being able to, to read the sensors, understand the environment, react to the environment. There's also, I think when we're talking about these kinds of things, you, you start to bring in an aspect of security. When we're talking about everything being connected, if a bad actor were able to get into a wireless communication um, and be able to yeah. manipulate in some way the information and the data that's going on between all the different infrastructure and vehicles and environment, they could also cause issues. What are the things that we need to be doing from a security perspective to ensure that that also, because that's always going to be a risk, how do we minimize that? Yeah. Now, this is very strongly in focus by all companies right now, because we see more and more 5G, 5G+. plus. So what is happening here, when you look at the amount of data, when you take an autonomous car, the amount of data that has been transferred can be up to 4,000 gigabyte uh, per, per wow. hour. This is crazy. Yeah? When you compare that, that's comparable to 270 million Twitter users producing in yeah. an entire day only 100 gigabyte. Yeah? So this yeah. is way beyond. And when such amounts of data are flowing in and out, when you have so much software involved, cybersecurity is really top on the list. And you have to make sure that all the source code that is in lower levels is really controlled, that suppliers are controlled that uh, this gets to the highest possible standards and we all know that it's a continuous race on both sides. So if someone has right. a bad intention, uh, there is a certain amount of risk. And therefore, the yeah. systems always have to have safety features, like on the autonomous driving, that a car brakes, uh, gets the warning lights on, and that it's getting into a controlled safe mode if something is uh, not safe. So therefore, right. Sometimes you use four tolerant computers that you have two or three running in parallel in order to make sure that the architecture, the electronic architecture, the actions are safe. Yeah? So all right. these features are getting built in. So the, the, the new software defined vehicles, they have two to five servers, central architectures, where you can run those features into. And with all that growth and, and the overall semiconductors that are going to have to go into a system like that with, you know, duplication of function and things along those lines, you can really see how our industry is the semiconductor industry, which is going to be about $550 billion now in 2022 is predicted to be a $1 trillion yes. industry in 2029. That growth is going to be astronomical uh, with, with the need for this and so many other different new technologies. It, it really is exciting. So obviously, T, you, you've really as a company have developed a tremendous amount of different technologies in this area. You know, I, I think, you know, many years ago, we might have thought of TE only as a connector company, but you guys have so much more in the way of sensors, in the way of relays, in the way of wireless and antennas, like you've mentioned. Uh, what are some of the products that you feel like are really going to lead from TE in this space where you guys are going to bring a lot of value as this market grows? Well, as you said before, TE Connectivity is a world leader for connectivity sensor solutions. And we have a range of product uh, from transportation, industrial application, uh, data and devices, data communication, energy. So when you see all this coming with a smart city, with a seamless connectivity everywhere, with all the sensing capabilities, so uh, we get more stronger in understanding system architectures in being an enabler for new architectures. So we team up very closely with our customers, uh, share technologies, share ideas. So it starts with miniaturization, with weight reductions, with extreme right. performance. So like going into Ethernet 112 gigabit, uh, 224 gigabit, enabling these kind of data speeds that are needed to have the safety functions. On the other hand, when you look at the electrification of everything, so we have from low voltage up to 1,000, 1,500 volts, uh, 500 amp, 800 amp, extreme fast charging capabilities, new material developments. Yeah. So a whole variety of activities, and we have uh, uh, 85,000 plus employees, and out of that we have more than 8,000 engineers that really are totally yeah. dedicated to innovate uh, we have open innovation, a lot of uh, activities where we look as well in synergies within the company. When we look at the ecosystem of future mobility, going from smart deliveries, last mile delivery, autonomous driving, 
electrification, high voltage application, yeah, to the air taxi, to the mobility pods. So I think TE is part of nearly everything. Yeah, so that's the good yeah. point about that. Even, yeah. Even on the appliances, on the home, uh, you, you get into that. So therefore we have a lot of good understanding across different architectures and can uh, team up very nicely with our customers to enable new ideas to come up with new ideas from our side because it's a win-win on both sides when you can uh, fire up some of those innovations and get them into the architectures. Right, right. Uh, incredibly exciting. I think the portfolio that you guys have today and, and the vision you have to continue to grow that portfolio in ways that are going to assist this new mobility market as it continues to expand, grow and, and look at new innovations is really, really exciting. Uh, Ralph, I can't thank you enough for, for joining me today and sharing some of your expertise uh, in this area and where the market's going. This to me is one of the most exciting areas of electrical engineering um, and what we're going to be focused on for the course of the next decade, two decades um, in, in new areas of innovation. And, and I, I really appreciate what TE is doing in this area. Um, and, and I've seen it with our customer base how you guys are helping them solve some of the tough issues um, in this ever expanding area. So thank you so much for the time. Todd, has been a great pleasure. I'm looking forward to an exciting future of mobility and uh, talking to you again in 30 years to see what has come true. <laughs> well, hopefully a lot sooner than that, Ralph, hopefully a lot <laughs> sooner than that. But yes, I, I think we're gonna, 30 years from now, we're both gonna be looking back at this and saying, wow, it is amazing how far things have come. Yeah. So I, I'd like to thank also our audience. Thanks so much for taking some time to spend time with us on The Current. Uh, if you have needs in this area, if you're looking at where your company wants to take your next generation of product in the area of mobility or any other electrical engineering questions that you may have, we at Future Electronics would absolutely love to help you with our engineering team, love to make introductions with, uh, team, with engineers at the TE team to assist you in your designs in this area or any other, please feel free to reach out to us at shaping the future, one word, shaping the future at futureelectronics.com. Um, and we would absolutely love to get our local engineers in touch with you um, and start assisting you in your designs. Uh, thank you so much for your time and we'll look forward to seeing you on the next episode of The Current.